the Roman Inquisition revealed. Our source, the location of our quote, a letter, the first two pages of it within our source. For a third time at least, the prisons of the Roman Inquisition were broken into after the ignominious flight of Pius IX in 1849. Many persons then in Rome reported the event, but instead of copying at second hand, I translate a letter addressed to myself by Signor Alessandro Gavazzi, formerly Chaplain General to the Roman Army, in reply to some questions I had to put to him. Under date of March 20th, 1852, he writes thus, My dear sir, in answering your questions concerning the palace of the Inquisition in Rome, I should say that I can only give a few superficial and imperfect notes. So short was the time that it remained open to the public, so great the crowd of persons that pressed to catch a sight of it, and so intense the horror inspired by that. A cursed place that I could not obtain a more exact and particular impression. I found no instruments of torture, for they were destroyed at the first French invasion, and because such instruments were not used afterwards by the modern Inquisition. I did, however, find in one of the prisons of the second court a furnace, and the remains of a woman's dress. I shall never be able to believe that that furnace was used for the living, it not being in such a place or of such a kind as to be of service to them. Everything, on the contrary, combines to persuade me that it was made use of for horrible deaths and to consume the remains of victims of inquisitorial executions. Another object of horror I found between the great hall of judgment and the luxurious apartment of the chief jailer, Primo Custode, the Dominican friar who presides over this diabolical establishment. This was a deep trap, a shaft opening into the vaults under the Inquisition. As soon as the so-called criminal had confessed his offense, the second keeper, who is always a Dominican friar, sent him to the father commissary to receive a relaxation of his punishment. With hope of pardon, the confessed culprit would go toward the apartment of the Holy Inquisitor. But in the act of setting foot at its entrance, the trap opened, and the world of the living heard no more of him. I examined some of the earth found in the pit below this trap. It was a compost of common earth rottenness, ashes, and human hair, fetid to the smell and horrible to the sight and thought of the beholder. But where popular fury reached its highest pitch was in the vaults of St. Pius V. I am anxious that you should note well that this pope was canonized by the Roman Church, especially for his zeal against the location of the last two pages of our letter, continuing, Heretics. I will now describe to you the manner how and the place where those vicars of Jesus Christ handled the living members of Jesus Christ and show you how they proceeded for their healing. You descend into the vaults by very narrow stairs. A narrow corridor leads you to the several cells which, for smallness and for stench, are a hundred times more horrible than the dens of lions and tigers in the Colosseum. Wandering in this labyrinth of most fearful prisons, which may be called graves for the living, I came to a cell full of skeletons without skulls, buried in lime. The skulls, detached from the bodies, had been collected in a hamper by the first visitors. Whose were those skeletons, and why were they buried in that place and in that manner? 
I have heard some popish ecclesiastics trying to defend the Inquisition from the charge of having condemned its victims to a secret death, say that the palace of the Inquisition was built on a burial ground belonging anciently to a hospital for pilgrims, and that the skeletons found were none other than those of pilgrims who had died in that hospital. But everything contradicts this papistical defense. Suppose that there had been a cemetery there. It could not have had subterranean galleries and cells, laid out with so great regularity. And even if there had been such, against all probability, the remains of bodies would have been removed on laying the foundations of the palace, to leave the space free for the subterranean part of the Inquisition. Besides, it is contrary to the use of common tombs to bury the dead by carrying them through a door at the side, for the mouth of the sepulchre is always at the top. And, again, it has never been the custom in Italy to bury the dead singly in quicklime, but in time of plague the dead bodies have been usually laid in a grave until it was sufficiently full and then quicklime has been laid over them to prevent pestilential exhalations by hastening the decomposition of the infected corpses. This custom was continued some years ago in the cemeteries of Naples and especially in the daily burial of the poor. Therefore the skeletons found in the Inquisition of Rome could not belong to persons who had died a natural death in a hospital, nor could any one, under such a supposition, explain the mystery of all the body being buried in lime with exception of the head. It remains, then, beyond doubt, that the subterranean vault contained the victims of one of the many secret martyrdoms of the Butcherly Tribunal. The following is a most probable opinion, if it be not rather the history of a fact. The condemned were immersed in a bath of slaked lime, gradually filled up to their necks. The lime, by little and little, enclosed the sufferers, or walled them up all alive. The torment was extreme, but slow. As the lime rose higher and higher, the respiration of the victims became more and more painful, because more difficult, so that what with the suffocation of the smoke and the anguish of a compressed breathing, they died in a manner most horrible and desperate. Some time after their death, the heads would naturally separate from the bodies and roll away into the hollows left by the shrinking of the lime. Any other explanation of the fact that may be attempted will be found improbable and unnatural. You may make any use of these notes of mine that you please, since I can warrant their truth. I wish that writers speaking of this infamous tribunal of the Inquisition would derive their information from pure history, unmingled with romance, for so many and so great are the historical atrocities of the Inquisition that they would more than suffice to arouse the detestation of a thousand worlds. I know that the popish impostor priests go about saying that the Inquisition was never an ecclesiastical tribunal, but a laic but you will have shown the contrary in your work, and you may also add, in order to quite unmask those lying preachers, that the palace of the Inquisition at Rome is under the shadow of the palace of the Vatican, that the keepers of the Inquisition at Rome are, to this day, Dominican friars, and that the prefect of the Inquisition at Rome is the Pope in person. I have the honor to be your affectionate servant, Alessandro Gavazzi. Gavazzi, Alessandro, a letter dated March 20th, 1852, in William Harris Rule, History of the Inquisition, London, Hamilton, Adams & Co., Wesleyan Conference Office.
New York, Scribner, Welford and Co., 1874, Volume 2, pages 320 through 323.